Okay, so a very warm welcome this morning. This is, uh, I guess, the first day of full silence because yesterday we still had a bit of interaction before breakfast, but by now, hopefully, the silence is developing not only in the space but also in the mind, at least a little bit that you can appreciate uh, in the context of all that suffering you left aside, left behind. <laughs> Someone's laughing already. And that's really why we're here, isn't it? It's to understand about suffering and happiness, what these two things really mean, and how to get, hopefully, less of the suffering, more of the happiness. So this is actually the whole thrust of the Buddha's teachings. Everything centers on these two themes. And of course, it's almost the same. But I'm just curious, to begin with, to ask people, what motivates you to be here? Is it the search for happiness, or is it freedom from suffering? There's a slightly different nuance there. How many people are motivated by the wish to be free from suffering, primarily? Hands raised higher? All right. A lot. And how many? For how many is the wish or the um, pursuit of happiness the main motivation for your practice? Okay, far fewer. Very interesting. And actually you're on the side of the Buddha there because the Buddha was motivated to seek the end of suffering when he left his palace uh, around the age, I guess, of 29, something like this. And he saw an old person, a sick person, a dead person, and, thank goodness, a holy person, or at least somebody on the spiritual path, pursuing the spiritual path, which is a a different direction to the way of the world. And it was the first time he was seeing these things. His father had kept him extremely protected in the palace. He had all different kinds of palaces for different seasons, of course, with lots of entertainment, women and music and all the rest, to try to hide these realities from him. Because actually his family hoped that he'd become a wheel-turning monarch and ruling across the entire world so he could get whatever he wanted, even if that was in a benevolent way still. um, That was the value that was most honoured in those days, even in the Buddha's time, right? So to actually take a path of renunciation and search for a different kind of happiness inside, a real freedom from suffering, was quite against the stream. It was going the opposite of the ways of the world. So it's the same thing for us today. And when we take our ordination, both myself and Ajahn Nito, uh, we chant, uh, May you give me the going forth for the sake of freedom from all suffering, sabba dukkha nisarana, freedom from all suffering, and for the realization of Nibbana, Nibbana Satchikaranataya, there is something to realize, there is something to experience, and that is synonymous with the end of suffering. And I think for me, one of the um, differences with the Buddha's teaching and any other um, teaching that we find is that the Buddha's focused on the freedom from all suffering, all. And his understanding of the whole range of suffering extends to everything every phenomena of body or mind. You know, there's no place in this world, in this mind, that is going to be free from suffering forever. That is only possible through the experience of Nibbāna. And yet, the path is a happy path. And, you know, many people have this myth, or this kind of wrong view, that uh, because the Buddha focuses on suffering, the cause, and also (laughs) the end of suffering, and the path to the end of suffering, that it's somehow pessimistic. But uh, he frames these Four Noble Truths in terms of a, the, a medical formulation. So suffering is likened to the diagnosis of a disease. The problem is we suffer. And that's sometimes a loaded word for people, but it means anything on the whole spectrum of not quite being satisfied, not quite getting your way, to the obvious physical suffering of sickness, death, you know, and then also the psychological suffering of losing those we love, bereavement, um, you know, conflict, uh, being separated from what we love and being associated with what we'd rather not be associated with. Yeah? And he even says that any wishing, actually, wishing and not getting what you wish for is suffering. We can see that all the time. 
you know, maybe you've come here hoping that your body will behave and <laughs> you won't have too much pain. <laughs> and if you do, you'll be able to wriggle out of it somehow, right? Maybe go to the sauna, find a nice place to lie down in the hall, and then, oh, there's not enough space, or, you know, whatever it is, you just have to face the fact that your body is aging. Your body has all these uh, niggles and aches. Uh, but luckily, the Buddha was uh, also a really good doctor and went further than many um, doctors have the time to do today, and he looked for the cause of that suffering. Uh, and the cause, of course, is so important if we want to actually uh, free ourselves from that disease. First, we have to know what the problem is. One of our biggest difficulties in life is we don't know what the problem is. So how can we find a solution? And so he diagnoses the problem, but then he also tells us what is the cause. And that cause is basically craving. And to my understanding, the word craving is just another word for discontent, right? Craving is predicated on a sense of lack, a sense of not being happy with what we have, wanting something that's not there. And basically not finding joy in the moment, joy in the mind, joy in our lives. Something to be grateful for, right? And that because we can't find that, we look for something more, we crave. And this is a big mistake. And then the next noble truth is uh, the prognosis, that there is an end of sabedukha, all suffering. And this is an extremely positive, incredible message. And I don't know how far you take that on faith at this point in your path, but just imagine that for a moment, that there can be freedom from all suffering. And here, clearly, we're not saying, you know, that there'll be no um, um, disappointments in life, there'll be no sickness, you'll still have to die. <laughs> and death is difficult, especially if we have our attachments. But it's possible to be free from all suffering at the mental level. There might still be bodily aches and pains. But it's possible that there's so much happiness inside, so much a sense of purpose and meaning inside, that you are able to maintain <coughs> a very deep equanimity, very deep contentment and compassion in the face of whatever life throws your way. And of course, the whole aim of the Buddhist path is that there'll be, uh, you'll, when you overcome craving, when you overcome um, this wish to to hear, to smell, to see, smell, taste, touch, think, know with the mind, that there'll be no reason to be reborn. And this is what we call Nibbana, an end of all rebirth. And then the fourth noble truth, and I've only got an hour here, <laughs> I want to get onto the happiness part, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is the path, the path to the end of all suffering. And the path is the noble path in that it creates uh, it, it turns the mind from the mind of a worldling to the mind of a noble being by seeing the truth, by uh, eradicating craving, greed, uh, aversion, hate, and delusion permanently. Imagine that for a moment. There's no more greed, there's no more aversion at all in the mind, and there's no more delusion. You see things as they are. You're living aligned to reality. What a great relief. I mean, I can't even imagine it, but I can see the degrees at this point, you know. One of the things about delusion is we can't really know we're deluded. <laughs> but even if you do know you're deluded, you're wise to that extent, right? <laughs> at least you know you're not quite seeing things as they are just yet. So the Buddha teaches this path, and it's um, each factor in the path is defined as right. So we have right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right endeavor, let's say, uh, right mindfulness and right stillness. And sometimes people think right, right, wrong, black, white. You know, maybe that's a bit um, dualistic. But in the context of the noble path, it basically means right in the sense that it's leading to the goal of freedom from all suffering. And that is why it's a noble path. Yeah, so this is actually um, what we do, if you like. And the Buddha was so compassionate to point us to those places that we suffer in order to stimulate or to generate a wish to be free. 
Again, if we don't know what the problem is, how can we know the solution? How can we find a solution? So it's no more pessimistic than somebody saying, okay, you've gone on a walk, say, into these lovely mountains, and you find that you're a little bit lost. And somebody says, actually, you've taken the wrong path. Is that depressing? Only if you're kind of stuffed and there's no other path. But if someone says, actually, here is the right path, you just come around this mountain and take care not to step in the lake, <laughs> stay on the actual side of the lake, and you'll get back safely and you'll be able to find comfort and ease, then this is a very positive thing. And what I wanted to talk about today is even more positive than that, because suffering and happiness are not two opposites in the way we might think that they are. The Buddha actually taught a beautiful causal sequence that links suffering to happiness and actually uh, says that suffering is the cause for happiness. So if you're suffering, it's great. This is the start. And the thing that makes the difference between just suffering because you're born, because you have to go through life, and then dying, feeling you've done nothing much meaningful with your life, the difference is when we have confidence, when we start getting confidence in the Buddha's teachings. So this is the kind of spanner in the works, if you like, that starts untying and unraveling um, our suffering, and unraveling samsara and taking us towards a beautiful path of inner happiness and peace. So this all starts when we hear the Dhamma and we get a little bit of confidence there. And before I get into that, I did want to say um, that searching for happiness <laughs> is the sure road to misery. Okay, so again, this is a causal sequence. It's not a search. Searching is very akin to craving. And the problem with searching for happiness, the reason that that leads to misery is usually because we're searching for the wrong type of happiness and we're searching in the wrong place, right? And Ajahn Chah said, he had this lovely phrase, he said, it's like you have an itch on your bum and you scratch your head. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if it's that way around or the other way. You've got an itch on your head and you scratch your bum. That's really stupid. <laughs> Basically, we really don't understand where this suffering is coming from. And uh, we look for the solution in the wrong place. You know? We look for happiness in the wrong place. And we look for the wrong type of happiness. And uh, this is a very beautiful sutta for those who might want to uh, read some more of the Buddhist texts. It's nice to have a way in. It's nice to kind of read these things in context, either in the context of a talk or something you're perhaps working with at this time. But this is a lovely sutta. It's called the Aranavibhanga Sutta, Majjhima number 139. Majjhima Nikaya was on the piano a couple of days ago. It's like the reddish book. And uh, in there, the Buddha defines happiness. And he says the types of happiness to be avoided, uh, even to be feared, but it really means feared in the sense that it's not really leading anywhere. And the type of happiness to be pursued. So he did talk about pursuing happiness, and he gave us the green light to really go ahead with that. And of course, the type of happiness, maybe obvious, I'm not sure, is um, the happiness of sensuality, the happiness of sensual pleasures. And, you know, beautiful sights, sounds, smells, tastes and touches, basically. And indulging in those, right? Pursuing those. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy nature. Nature's something lovely, you know, it can calm the senses. That's why we chose this place, or Dante Nuto chose this place, because it's a beautiful, quiet, um, serene place to meditate. You know, we're surrounded by these mountains. I feel like I'm protected by them, it's as though they're, you know, just holding us uh, calmly and safely between them in this cosy, cosy room. And uh, this is very calming for the senses. It's the opposite of stimulation. But it's those pleasures that we try to stimulate ourselves with, you know, whether it's social media or it's kind of indulging in your favorite food, there comes a point where it actually turns into something quite repulsive. How much chocolate cake can you really eat? You know, um, even if it's a partner and you want to express your affection to them, you know, how much sensuality can you enjoy before it just gets boring and stale 
and you actually want a break. You just want to be by yourself, sit quietly, have a cup of tea if you're English. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's limited at the very best. And the other problem with it is it doesn't... There's something called the law of diminishing returns. So it works for a while, you know. Ajanito was talking yesterday about... Um, enjoying all kinds of uh, sports, and some of them very exciting, like paragliding. I used to want to do that too. Um, you know, what else was it, like uh, kayaking or um, I don't know what else. Some people jump from buildings with a little parachute and there's no, not enough time to put the parachute up. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we can go for all those kind of uh, pleasures, but they end up just being, uh, uh, they leave us in the same place we began. They don't fill that hole in our heart. They don't give us that sense of meaning that we're longing for. You know, something more profound. Um, and the happiness the Buddha talked about was not only something enjoyable, but something profound, something meaningful. Not just a kind of giddy mood, you know, right now I'm smiling because everything's going my way. Everyone can do that, right? My first teacher, Goenka, said, um, he used to uh, say this lovely little poem, it's easy enough to be happy when life flows along like a sweet song. But the one worthwhile is the one with a smile when everything goes dead wrong. <laughs> yeah, That's a real kind of happiness. That's something sustainable, lasting, something coming from within. So the Buddha's saying we shouldn't be pursuing those external happinesses. They're unstable, they're transitory, they're going to change. And they never really give us that satisfaction that we're after. It's like, a, there's another simile of um, a dog uh, finding a bone that's smeared with blood and it has the taste and the smell of meat, but it actually doesn't have any nutrition at all. So that poor dog can chew on the bone, you know, can get excited by the smell, but it actually doesn't satisfy that dog's hunger. And that's something like sensual pleasures. So we don't pursue them, we don't condemn them either, but we don't pursue them. And instead he said we can pursue and we should pursue and develop and cultivate inner happiness. Which, guess what he defined that as? Any ideas? The four jhanas. He said they should be pursued and cultivated. They are not to be feared. So this hopefully overcomes this myth that goes around in Buddhist circles that jhana is somehow, and jhanas are like states of deep stillness. So as we quieten the mind, we go deeper and deeper inside, and we can come to the place where basically everything stops moving, and the mind and its objects unify. And these are states of great bliss, great peace. Sometimes people describe them as a feeling of unconditional love, or even union with God. Like I mentioned my friend's mother yesterday. You know, she had a maybe a pre- Samadhi experience, a pre-jhana experience, seeing this beautiful light and almost going into it. And that felt like union with God. So these are very altered states and very expansive, very beautiful, very nourishing and um, deeply productive of insight as well. So the Buddha said these are to be pursued and followed um, because they're not based on sensuality. They're actually based on the opposite. And he described the happiness of those things as um, the happiness of renunciation. So that means giving up some of what we uh, crave for, what we're attached to, um, maybe some of our wrong views even about happiness and, and pain. Giving up, as in stopping controlling this process. Yeah? Letting things be, letting things unfold. And he also described them as um, states of seclusion, being secluded from the senses, from sensuality, from even the five senses themselves. They are states of peace, upasama sukha, the happiness of peace. Yeah? Is peace happy or is it just boring? Happy? <laughs> it's a different taste, isn't it? It's a different quality of happiness than maybe what we're used to. And at first we sometimes don't see very much in peace. Yeah, we, uh, we think everything's stopped or everything's gone a bit dull. Our minds aren't kind of bright enough to really catch on to the peace and so we go to sleep instead. 
you know, we go into this kind of dreamlike state, and it's it's getting there, but it's not energized enough. And lastly, he said these are the um, the happiness of enlightenment, sambodhi sukha, which doesn't mean that these states of samadhi are enlightenment themselves, but it does mean that they're getting close, and it's giving you a taste of how it feels to be free from craving, free from suffering, at least for a while, and usually for a long while. You know, jhana states can last. Hours. I mean, I don't know. Some people say they can go in for like a half an hour or something. Um, yeah, I think generally speaking, <laughs> I'm not allowed to speak too much from experience, but uh, they last much longer. Even pre jhana, you know, you can find yourself sitting for hours without a thought or without any um, obvious suffering arising. So these are beautiful states, but I don't want to kind of freak you all out and, and make you feel that that's too far away, but talk about. Um, the path towards that happiness, which is gradual, which is sequential, and which happens despite yourself. (laughs) Thank goodness, right? Because I know from my experience that when I get involved, even if I think I'm getting involved in a helpful way, I mess it up. (laughs) The mind's just getting quiet, and maybe some bliss starts to come. I, ooh, (laughs) you know, many times I've thought, okay, how much bliss is there? Like, shall I see? Is it in the whole body? And then bang, you know, you're back again. <laughs> or it recedes from you, you know. Or, or sometimes it's subtler still. The mind just kind of lurches forward slightly. Ooh, what's this? It's subverbal. And then again, it recedes. So these things happen when we get out of the way. And it's a natural process. So I wanted to talk about more about what that happiness is and how it arises from suffering. Uh, and first give you a little uh, overview of the path, overview of that sequence. And I'm starting here from the suffering itself, which the Buddha says is caused by birth. <laughs> Not being born, but actually being alive. Right? The fact that we're already in this human existence is the cause for suffering. And from there, as I said, instead of just going into old age, sickness and death, Um, there's a way to turn the course and that is through hearing the teachings and developing confidence. So from suffering, this uh, causal sequence leads to confidence as the next step. Confidence in the Buddha's teachings, confidence in the path. From that confidence, it leads to joy, pamoja. From joy, and I'm just going through this quickly for now, from joy to rapture, piti. This is where we start to meditate and, and feel, find that inner happiness. From piti to pasadi, which is tranquility, a kind of quietening of everything, even the piti gets very calm. And then sukha, happiness, or I like the translation contentment for that. It's a contented kind of pleasure um, that's getting increasingly still. And from this happiness, Guess what happens? The samadhi states, the deep stillness of the mind. So the stillness is born from happiness. Not a dull state, not a state of nothingness. It's a state that's born from happiness as the mind increasingly settles. And then from that samadhi, from these deep states of stillness, we see things as they really are. Yata, bhuta, jnanadasana means insight into the way things really are. So again and again in the suttas, uh, the Buddha does say that insight comes from stilling the mind. Or let's say from the stillness of the mind. Because the stillness of the mind happens when the hindrances are overcome. Craving and aversion and the tiredness, restlessness and doubts are all overcome. And the mind just settles deeply inside. And he gives a lovely simile, which is meant to indicate that this is a natural process. It happens um, not because you want it to, um, not even if you don't want it to, not because you, you know, you might have low self-worth or you might feel you're a hopeless meditator. That doesn't matter. You can't stop nature by such views. So the simile is one from nature. He says, just as when the rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top, The water flows down along the slope and fills the cleft, gullies and creeks. These being full, fill up the pools. These being full, fill up the lakes. These being full, fill up the streams. 
These being full, fill up the rivers. And these being full, fill up the great oceans. So too, and here he's starting from the ultimate cause of existence, but I'll start from suffering. With suffering as a proximate cause, confidence comes to be. With confidence as a proximate cause, joy. With joy as a proximate cause, rapture. With rapture as a proximate cause, tranquility, happiness, stillness, and seeing things as they truly are. So when one stage is filled, the next stage happens as a matter of course. And this is how and where we can put our attention in the path. So if we find that we're still stuck in suffering, then maybe contemplate, you know, the, the Dhamma, the fact that you've now found a path. Why did you come here? What was the confidence that arose in you to enable you to give eight days of your life to be here? You must have had an inkling that you'd find something of value, something of worth, right? So what gave rise to that confidence? Maybe you've seen monks and nuns or other lay practitioners that have inspired you. People were saying the other day that uh, what inspires them is to see people who are compassionate, who are kind, who are happy, or who actually give ourselves, give us the feeling of empowerment by um, encouraging us to follow our own inner truth, you know, to explore along our own line of reasoning or inquiry and um, give us that that uh, possibility to find the truth inside. And the Buddha did that too. He said, you know, you are your own master in a sense. Like it's up to you to find the way. But here is the map. Here is the uh, path that I trod. Try it. Try it and find out for yourself. Come and see. He used to actually um, give the ordination by saying, Ehi bikuni, come bikuni. Just come. Come and live the holy life, you know, come and find out for yourself if it's really possible to make an end of suffering. This is how I've done it, this is where I advise you to look, but you have to do the work. And for me this gives enormous confidence because there's no agenda there, there's no motive, no teachers saying, hey, come on board with me and I'll kind of make you happy. If they say that, forget it. <laughs> no one has a magic pill, um, you know. Don't join a cult, basically. You know, look for people who are giving you that uh, that possibility to find the truth for yourself, and also some guidance along the way. So for me, when I first encountered the Buddha's teachings in India, it was such a great relief because I had enough experience of suffering, and I felt that that experience of suffering wasn't only my own. It felt that it was connected to an existential kind of suffering. Um, just the suffering I'd hear about in the news, <laughs> it's enough, isn't it? It should be enough, really. I mean, if we can really stop ourselves from going numb or from having an overload, you know, you're reading about people just brutally killing others in the name of their country or, you know, their race. How can people inflict such harm on themselves? So when I heard this, I just thought there must be another way, you know, and there must be some way that I can live a life that's compassionate and remove those arrows of greed and, and hate and delusion, really, from my heart. So when I heard the Buddha's teachings and I, you know, found that there is actually a practical path, that there's something we can do about this, he said that suffering is there, but suffering is to be understood. Yeah, the cause is there, but the cause can be eradicated, it can be abandoned. There's an action we can take. I just felt immense relief. And that led to a great deal of inspiration and confidence that I decided from then and there to uh, commit the rest of my life to practice and to kind of pace myself, you know, to give myself another retreat a few months later and then to serve on some retreats. And I found that just as the practice was working for me, it was working for others as well. So the Buddha was always concerned with a kind of universal remedy not only something that works for one or two people of a particular gender or race or um, sexual orientation, but something that is a universal solution to a universal malady. So that gave me enormous hope. And uh, yeah, before then, I'd been traveling around India with my backpack and going to all the most beautiful places in the Himalayas, um, going to a couple of full moon parties as well, which I didn't exactly stay completely uh, straight. 
Um, but none of that was interesting to me anymore after I found this way to find real happiness inside. And even though my meditation, I don't know if I could say it was deep or not, but I started to understand that I create my world, I create my happiness, and I'm reacting to things inside me, not to things in the outside world. So that meant the solution could come from within. And I started living a much more ethical life just naturally. I don't think I was very unethical, but I was a teenager at that time, I mean 19. And by the time I'd done my first retreat, I just had no interest in um, in those sensual things I'd been into before, not even the music that I was really obsessed with. Um, was as interesting as just being quiet and being present to my experience, whether, you know, just traveling or in meditation. And it was a bit of a purging sort of a couple of years with all these songs that I put in there coming back to haunt me, you know, terrible songs, some of them. (laughs) I thought, what did I do by putting all that in? So it was just natural for me to start letting go of those things. And the more I practiced, the more that confidence developed. And, of course, then I started meeting really good people who I could trust, teachers that helped me to uh, go deeper in my practice. And uh, and all this while, this aspiration to renounce and live as a monastic was growing, was developing. It wasn't something I felt I had to do. It wasn't something that, uh, you know, the world outside wasn't something I rejected. It was something that, through understanding its nature, just didn't have the same appeal anymore. And yet, at the same time, compassion was arising, a a feeling to be connected to others in order to help them on their path. So this is a really beautiful um, response to suffering. You know, usually we have um, unwise responses. We experience some uh, suffering in our lives, some disappointment, maybe um, some grief, And we think, oh no, I don't want this, this is terrible. Um, You know, we push it away, we don't want to feel it. We spin out. Maybe we even turn to alcohol or drugs. uh, Just because we can't bear to feel the pain, you know. And that's totally understandable. Uh, There's a lot of suffering in life and there's a lot of tragedy. And, you know, this is the way we're conditioned, is to run away from that. Uh, so we resist it, we push it away, we, sometimes in our meditation, you know, it's not quite going the way we want, and although you might not say it's outright suffering, there's still a sense of, oh, okay, I'm going to be with this, I don't really like it, but I'll just kind of stand back a bit, and then you realise, oh, I'm resisting, and you soften the mind, and you open up to it instead, and lo and behold, that suffering softens too, yeah, so we have to find this skillful way to handle The other way that we often um, respond to suffering is we wallow in it. We make it all about us, you know, this is so unfair, why me? You know, I've done everything right, this shouldn't really be happening. And uh, and we wallow. We even create an identity around it. I am the one who, dum dum dum, everything went wrong for. It's always going to go wrong for, right? Project it into the future. So these are the ways we're used to working with suffering, actually not working with it at all, staying away from it or kind of just getting swallowed up. And the Buddha gave a different approach. He said that suffering is to be understood. Right? Suffering is to be understood. So this involves finding a way to handle it skillfully. Not to bring it on. (laughs) I remember one nun once said to me, yeah, suffering, bring it on, bring it on, you know. Mara, I see you, come on, Mara. <laughs> this is not necessarily the way, you know, we don't have to take on more than we we need to. But um, the skillful handling involves finding a, a beautiful way to relate, to relate wisely to what arises. And the Buddha gave this in the three right intentions, the second factor of the path. The yeah, first one is an attitude of kindness non-ill will, which is basically a synonym for metta. So this means being a friend to ourselves, not only in times of happiness, but in times of sickness, times of uh, despair. Yeah, A friend's not much use, are they, if they just kind of only want to come and see you when you're in a good mood and you know when you can give them some energy, uh, when you've got something to, uh, to give. A real friend is there through thick and thin. 
And I've seen and I have a relationship with such a spiritual friend in Ajahn Brahm that he has been with me throughout this whole journey and before. You know, from the time that I met him as my teacher in 2010, too long, I say I should have met him earlier. But anyway, from that time, you know, I had this sense that I was under his wing in the sense that he had genuine loving kindness and a wish for me to be, uh, to prosper and to flourish on the path. That's the highest form of loving kindness, I think, you know, a wish for your own spiritual well-being and growth without expecting anything in return. And there's always been that sense that he needs nothing from me at all. You know, if I passed away now, he'd probably say, oh, yeah, but it's a shame it was so soon. She could have done more, but, you know, just accept it. There'd be no personal loss uh, because this is just pure unconditional love. And we can have that same attitude of unconditionality towards whatever arises in our body or mind. You know, we can actually soften to it. We can give it space. We can widen the circle of what's acceptable to us. Stop stigmatizing emotions that we don't think are, should be there, you know, but include it all. Include the whole emotional, mental landscape with a sense of friendliness and even respect. This is another thing that I find extraordinary in all my spiritual teachers who have seen deeply into the Dhamma, that they have not a sense of superiority or arrogance in any way, but a sense of respect for every single being. And perhaps especially those beings who are trying, those beings who are genuinely, genuinely pursuing the path. There's enormous respect and a sense of trust that's granted almost automatically. And that is incredibly powerful because it helps us to trust and respect ourselves you know when we have that reflected back to us then it can start to teach us how to do it for ourselves so we can take examples in our lives and then try and respond to our own inner world in the same way you know how would you treat a friend how would you um, respond to someone who came to you saying I'm struggling right now would you be like oh for goodness sake you always struggle you know <laughs> Uh, I don't want to see you today, or, you know, you should be happy. <laughs> or would you say, oh, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? Tell me all about it. Let me listen. So this metta is a very open, receptive, um, <coughs> warm and friendly attitude that we can have towards the suffering that arises. And uh, the next one is to be gentle. Yeah, Avihimsaka, it literally means non-violent. And uh, Ajahnita was saying yesterday this beautiful idea of um, stopping the fight. It's like making an armistice with your mind. Ajahn Brahm talks about that in one of my favorite talks. I think it's called um, A Peace with Experience. If anybody wants a brilliant Dhamma talk that can stay with you for the rest of your life, look it up. It's actually on YouTube. It's an old talk, but it's called At Peace with Experience. And it's just sets you off with the right attitude. It's like the A to Z of what you need, really. I mean, everything else stems from there. And he talks about making an armistice with the mind. So I looked that up online, what really is the meaning. And it's defined as a temporary ceasefire so that a lasting remedy for peace can be found, a lasting solution for peace can be found. So we stop the fight. And how does that create a remedy? When we stop the fight, we can actually see what's going on. We can see how we're building suffering. We can see what we're doing. We can find a solution. If we're running away from suffering, we can't really understand it. We can't have that chance to really um, find an appropriate response. So we, do, we make an armistice. We stop the fight. You know, we respect that this is just nature, cause and effect arising. And we stand back a little bit. We be really, really gentle. Part of that gentleness is patience. And um, in a couple of months, I'm giving a retreat on patience. And I spoke to my um, bikuni friend, Venerable Upeka, and I said, oh, patience is going to be really unpopular with everybody. <laughs> we had to jazz it up and call it something like the um, gentle art of patience or something like this. <laughs> and she said, yes, there's nothing we hate more than patience. <laughs> And it's true, isn't it? There's nothing we hate more than patience because we want our results now. We don't want it later. 
It's like, okay, I'll be patient now if it's going to come later. <laughs> <laughs> but can you be patient even if someone tells you it's never going to come? Can you still be patient? And patience is actually something quite beautiful. It's quite refined. Being patient just means being now, waiting where we are, stopping again that craving. Being patient means landing here and just being with. With no agenda as to how things are going to unfold, when they're going to unfold, don't pick up that burden of time. You know, for me as a monastic, it's dangerous because the longer you've been in robes, and now it's 28 years. No, not 28 years, 18 years. I'm not that old. 28 years of practice, though. And 28 years of practice, it's like, oh, shouldn't I be enlightened by now? And what I recognized is that in the beginning of the practice, it's easy to be patient. But the further on you go, the harder it is to be patient sometimes. Because <laughs> you think, okay, this is like further down the path now, so I should be getting there, right? <laughs> and of course we are, you know, every single step is a step forward, or a step inward, should I say. Um, but sometimes we don't notice the, uh, the change. The change is something you can notice when you look back, you know, a year, two years, five years. And we see that things really are developing, but not in the time we wish. And if we can just take away this idea of time then actually nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong. Whether we get enlightened in this life, I'd like to get enlightened in this life, um, but really, what divides this life from the next? It's just another moment. Death is a process. It's just a continuation. You know, it's not really an end. So the main thing is that we're practicing and that we continue practicing. And eventually, if you don't stop practicing, then, you know, you will start to get the fruits. It's inevitable, and that's why I love this sutta so much. It talks about this as a process. So we become patient, and patient not waiting for something to happen, but just patient for the sake of the beauty of patience. <laughs> See if you can notice that. And then the last beautiful, wise way of relating to the suffering that arises is um, a sense of... <coughs> uh, it's hard to translate, but the actual word is renunciation, renouncing. And I also have trouble with that word, but also the word letting go, because it sounds like we're doing something. And um, letting go is not an action, it's a result. It's a result of establishing these right ways of relating. And it happens quite naturally, that things start to fade. I was thinking maybe changing the word let go to let fade. <laughs> but it starts from letting be. You know, you just are with what's there, with this beautiful good karma attitude is Ajahn Brown's description. We're making good karma by the way we're aware. And then we just allow things to, to arise and also to fade. As long as we're not fueling things with craving and aversion, then they will eventually fade. They're just old karma coming up to the surface. And if we respond with positive karma, with kindness, with gentleness, and letting them be, not identifying, not controlling these things, that's a part of letting go then they naturally fade. So the problem disappears. So this is some of the ways we handle our suffering, and this gives rise to enormous confidence and also to joy. From that joy we gain inspiration. Sorry, from the confidence we gain inspiration, and that gives a lot of joy. And of course, even as we respond to the world using loving kindness or compassion, that gives a certain joy to the mind. You know, the joy of loving kindness. It's a very, very beautiful, um, happy state of mind. It's a beautiful intention. And after a while, in the beginning, it might seem like, oh, I'm just trying to be kind. It's not very genuine. But after a while, the more you practice it, the more you start to actually experience that metta as a quality in the heart. So this gives rise to joy. And one of the important things in the Buddha's teaching is that uh, he doesn't say just, oh, just experience joy, then move on. He says, really linger in it. Really bring it up in the mind. Reflect, for example, on your goodness, on feelings of gratitude, things in your life you can be grateful for. Um, you know, just allow the mind to enjoy the peace without looking for anything more and really soak it in. So we have to learn to soak it in. And this has been proved by neuroscience now. There's something called... Um, <laughs> There's a book by someone called Rick Hansen called Hardwiring Happiness. It's really good if you want to read it. Um, 
The only caveat on that is that he talks about any kind of happiness. And although it's supposed to be ethical happiness, he doesn't talk much about ethics. Um, so the Buddhist happiness is ethical. It has a wholesome flavor to it. But still, even in uh, neuroscience, it's been shown that if you actually take in the good, take in the goodness of your life, of all those things you have to be grateful for, it starts to change the, the brain. The brain is uh, malleable, yeah? And it starts to have effects. So those states become more and more spontaneous for us. And we start experiencing joy increasingly. So when we then go to sit down to meditate, we've already got confidence, we've already got um, an amount of joy just from living a beautiful life. And all we really need to do is perhaps bring up some of that joy in the beginning through a bit of metta or, um, you know, like we did yesterday, imagine you're in this safe space and you're just feeling content, just bring up these attitudes. And that is usually enough. And then the mind will naturally, when it's ready, when there's joy, when there's energy, it will naturally find the breath, or it will go towards loving kindness, or it just, just works with whatever arises in a skillful way. So you don't need to make much effort. And then the piti will start to arise, the happiness, uh, the rapture that comes from inside. From the rapture, it starts to calm down, but usually it only calms down when we've had our fill. That's what I noticed. Like in the beginning when I started to allow the PT, and this is probably a good, uh, so 28 years of practice, the first 14 years was really about, for me anyway, the focus was on developing equanimity. And uh, once I turned more to samadhi practice, uh, development of deep states of meditation, I was kind of not given, but in a way the Buddha says again and again to enjoy the wholesome state. So I felt like I had permission to really enjoy pleasant feelings of body or of mind. And it took a while to learn to really soak it in. And at first it was like, oh, I'm not sure if this is okay or not. But then you read the suttas and the Buddha says it is. And um, after a while it felt like I needed to really get enough in order for it to quieten down. But after a while, once I'd been replenished, and it's very refreshing for the mind, gives you a lot of energy, then it naturally starts to quieten. And that quietness, tranquility, is even more sublime. It's more nourishing. It's more calming. It's uh, less doing, less of a sense of self. And from that tranquility, it deepens into... Um, more pleasure that's coming increasingly from the mind. So this is sukha. And this is a kind of contented joy. And the reason it's so happy is because we're hardly doing anything at this stage. You know, at this stage, the breath might even start to fade or disappear. And I know some of you, and I know that for some, the breath starts to disappear from time to time, and then it might come back again. And that's okay, you know, that's just because your mind isn't quite used to that. And maybe it's a little bit dull, it doesn't yet see the beauty in that state when the breath disappears. But after a while, when you start to stay there for longer, then the happiness builds and the, the eyes kind of open. You start to see more and more. And uh, yes, I don't want to go too much further, but at this stage there's a lot of happiness. And precisely because there's an ending of suffering. You know, every step of the path is synonymous, every step of happiness is synonymous with an ending of some kind of suffering. As the suffering dissipates, the happiness increases. As the happiness increases, and you can trust that happiness, you can let go into that happiness because this is a wholesome joy, then the suffering disappears. So by now you're doing very little, and from there the mind can enter deep states of stillness. And again, you know, the, they're still because there's so little suffering. And because there's so little suffering, there's nothing for us to do. We don't need to do anything. We've got this stillness, this contentment, this quietness inside. Yeah. So this is a little overview, and I don't want to talk too much longer, because I think an hour is quite a long time to talk. It's hard to take it all in. But um, the main thing I wanted to convey today is that this is all a natural process that there is a kind of happiness that is to be pursued. And that happiness is the result of putting causes in place, putting beautiful, skillful causes in place that start with confidence and 
learning a wise way of handling suffering, not pushing it away, not trying to prematurely transcend it and move on to something better, but to actually go through it with wisdom, with kindness. And it's these skillful perceptions that start to transform our experience. It starts off with an attitude, you know, for example, you make peace, you stop the war, you have an attitude of peace. So there's this thing here which is maybe, say it's tension or tightness or anxiety, but the one watching is peaceful. So at first it seems like there's a duality, but the more you're able to be with that, with a peaceful mind, the more everything that you're watching becomes peace. It's like the intention becomes the object. And in this way, you're starting, things are starting to become unified. So we create these beautiful, create means, we put them in place, we put these conditions in place, not because you know how to, but just because you've been hearing the Dhamma. Right? And the Dhamma makes sense. You've got a bit of confidence that metta is, more, um, is a wiser response than aversion. So you generate feelings and thoughts and attitudes of loving kindness. And what you soon start to realize is you're observing love. You're observing metta. Right? So the power to transform our experience is in our minds. But it doesn't come through wanting. It comes with staying present with with this beautiful, loving, kind, friendly, respectful attitude, an attitude of making peace, not war. So I think that is enough, and hopefully you can continue to explore this whole realm of suffering and happiness, and just appreciate happiness when it arises. It might not be how you imagine it to be. It might be very quiet. It might simply be more like an end of suffering and you haven't seen the beauty in that yet, but just notice it. Every moment between your thoughts that's silent, that's beauty, there's beauty there. Every moment of being present to whatever it is, there's something beautiful there. Mindfulness is happiness. So keep on exploring this whole realm.